Well, hey there, wherever you're at, whatever you're doing, if whether it's morning or evening, I'm so glad you could join me and Grace Church uh, to talk about one of my favorite things. Actually, two of my favorite things. Jesus and football. I know you may find this a surprise that I like football. I've never mentioned it before, except maybe a few thousand times. But I, have to, I just have to tell you that we won our game, right? We, we won the, the divisional championship. And this is, I, I coach a team of 10-year-olds, and they're just a, a great group of kids. Uh, this is a team in their first three years of, of playing, won no more than two games a season. I think only won one game one season. And so on their fourth year, we've won more games than they have the whole rest of their career. These kids that have been playing at six and, or seven and eight and nine, and then at 10 years old, we won six games. We went four and four in the regular season, and we won the championship, the divisional championship, by a lot. I'm 24 to nothing. Now, one of the things that makes it special is because this, this group, this group of, of little 10-year-olds, we don't have a star. We don't have a star. We, like, no one just carries the whole load. No one, you know, is, the, is just a, the, the dominant force. And so it really was a team effort, and that's special. And it's special for me because I get to coach these kiddos, and they've made so many improvements. They've, they've, they've developed so much as, as players. I've seen them develop mental fortitude as well as football skills, and it's just been incredible. It's been incredible. Now, if you want to be dominant in any sport or any kind of team activity, you really need two things. Because while we went four and four in regular season and we won, you know, the two games that that took us to the divisional championship, there's a whole other league above us that we would have competed in, but we wouldn't have won because we don't have the one of the two things. To win in, in an upper league, to, to win whether it's in 10-year-old football or 12-year-old baseball or if, if you're a mathlete, if you want to win the academic challenge, you got to have a couple of things. And the higher the, you know, the higher the level goes, the higher the competition goes, the more that these two things are important. And these two things are this. You do need an incredibly dominant person on your team. You need somebody that, that is ahead of the skills of most of the people that you're playing against. You need that if you want to be dominant in that league. You know, you need somebody. You need somebody playing on your junior high football team that, that has the shave. It's a big deal. Right? You, you need somebody, uh, you know, the, the, the joke was always when I was, you know, when I was playing in high school that, yeah, this guy drove himself to the games and, and his wife and kids, right? That was always... He was a full-grown man, apparently, playing with a, with a bunch of, uh, you know, teenagers. And, and you see that. You need that, like with national championships and, and whatever it is, you have just a player that is absolutely dominant. And if you have that, that's one half of the equation. The other half of the equation is you need good coaching. And good coaching is a lot of things. It's... It's X's and O's, and it's game planning and strategic, you know, schemes, and it's all of that. But maybe above all of that, it's, it's advocacy. It's, it's giving them courage. It's giving them support. It's believing in them and trying to convince them that, that they can do it, right, and that you believe they can do it. And, and it's helping them develop as, as people and as whatever skill they're trying to learn. You need that if you're going to be dominant in a team. But to, to really win at life, I don't even know that you have to have, to have a dominant player, right, because what does it mean to win at life? I think, you can, I think you can do really well in life without being necessarily the best at much. Now, you're going to have things you're better at and worse at and, and things that you're better at than a lot of people. But I would say that you really need that support. 
you want that, that lopsided victory. You need that advocate. And in the last 20 months, let me tell you, the last 20 months, it's been easy to feel like you're alone. Like you're doing this on your own. Whether you really were alone in isolation or quarantine or, or, or maybe because of fear, right? Maybe you were afraid or, and, and, and that's not a judgment, maybe rightly so. I mean, or maybe you were isolated because other people around you had reasons not to come around you and you felt very alone. You felt like no one was on your side. Or maybe, maybe there were actually people around you, but you felt very isolated because it felt like no matter who was around you, you had no one on your side. No one to support you. Everything was stacked against you. The odds were stacked against you. No one was really for you. The people that you thought you could trust, you couldn't. Maybe, maybe over the last 20 months, your idea of people who support you have changed. Maybe, maybe you felt let down by friends or you felt let down by the government or you felt let down by, by elected officials that you thought had the best for you, whatever your stance is. Maybe you felt let down by, by friends and family and parents or communities or school boards or teachers or students or, I don't know. But I've talked to a lot of people who felt very let down, who felt very isolated, who felt very alone, who felt like they had no one to support them. There was no one to help them. No one maybe who could help. Talk to several pastor friends, and, and they're like, you know what, and, and I've said this sentiment too, in and, and every, every tragedy and every up and down season in a church, we've been able to, pastors have been able to go and talk to other pastors, people, maybe pastors that were older or pastors that pastored somewhere else, and say, hey, how did you deal with this, right? How did you deal with a... A split. How did you deal with lack of resources? How did you deal with you know, whatever, like good stuff and bad stuff? How did you deal with it? But more and more pastors I talked to said, you know what, I don't know anybody. I don't know any pastor that's dealt with a global pandemic. And you feel very alone. Like there's no one to help you. There's no one that even could help. Or maybe you feel like there's no one that even understands no one understands what you're going through. And whenever you have no advocacy, no support, this causes stress, anxiety, depression. I mean, it causes mental health problems and it causes physical problems. And we're seeing that. We're seeing that here in the United States. We're seeing it amongst church leaders. We're seeing it among congregations. And you might be in that same place that you say, you know what? I, I thought I had support. I thought I had help. I thought I had people I can turn to. But I don't. Well, let me tell you, advocacy makes all the difference in the world. It makes the difference to a football team having a, having a coach that, advocates for you, that, that really helps you out, that supports you. Uh, but it's not just in sports and it's not just in competition. It makes all the difference in the world in so many areas. In healthcare, they have healthcare advocates. And what, what do healthcare advocates do? They make sure that you, if, if you are the patient in whatever state you are in, they make sure that you get the right treatment. They advocate for you, for the doctors and the insurance and, and all the myriad of things that you have to go through. When you're at maybe your weakest or your lowest or your least healthy, you're least able to fight for yourself. Advocacy and addiction. I mean, a lot of times advocacy is, is the difference between your sobriety and not. 
And that's what sponsors are, and that's what family support is, and that's what, I mean, all of that is, is forms of advocacy, legally. Legal advocacy. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm glad we live in a country that, that gives the right to an attorney Right, and if you can't afford one, one will be appointed to you. You've heard many times, hopefully on a TV show, but maybe in real life too, that that we provide that 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 our government provides an advocate for you who knows the law, so that you don't come in to a situation where no one is there to support you and everything is stacked against you. Advocacy makes all the difference professionally. Advocacy makes all the difference professionally. Whether it's a mentor helping you navigate a company, whether it's a, whether it's a, an adv- a, a, a mentor that's trying to help you navigate a career or, a, or an industry or a field, or whether it's a, like a group advocacy, a, a union, right? A, some kind of guild or union that helps you, that advocates salary to make sure there's, there's safe working conditions, right? Advocacy helps. And lest we forget that there's, there's peer advocacy that, that just supports you, right? We, like, like you and I would just call these friends, but these are friends that support you in all of your endeavors, or they tell you, hey, that's, that's not a good idea. Don't do that. But it's, it's also equally important to know, right? It's, it's, important to, it's important to have those people, to have an advocate. But I think it's equally important to know that you have one. It's, it's, if, you, if you have an advocate, but you don't know you have an advocate, it's like not having one. And it's, a, it's important to have one, because without one, you, you're, you're, you're stuck, you're lost. No, there, no, there is no one to turn to. But not knowing that there's anyone to turn to, even when there is someone, is, is just as bad. And we need an advocate in every area of our life and because life we talked about is full of good and full of bad and it's, it's full of hard things and good things and, and, and you need an advocate when you deal with hard people, when you deal with hard situations, when you deal with life-altering decisions. You need an advocate and you need to know that you have an advocate. You, you need people on your side and you need to know that people are on your side. Well, the same thing is true with spirituality. When it comes to the spiritual, when our, our spiritual lives, we need an advocate. We can't do it on our own. And if you'll turn with me to Romans 8, I'm going to talk about an advocate we have in God. Because Romans 8, the end of Romans 8 is the conclusion through chapters 5 through 8, and, and, and a lot of people agree, most people agree, that it's really a conclusion on chapters 1 through 8, that Paul is, is bringing his argument to kind of this, this, this pinnacle, this climax, this peak, because he said over and over and over, you can't do it on your own. You cannot earn God's love on your own. You cannot earn God's forgiveness on your own. You are too far gone to earn it on your own, but you are not too far gone. Because you have God, Jesus Christ. You have Jesus Christ. You have the Spirit. I mean, you have, you have all these things working for you, but you can't do it on your own. You need the spiritual advocate. And so he is, he is saying... You don't, you you can't achieve it on your own, but you have an advocate. We have have no condemnation, he says in the first part of chapter 8. He says we have the certainty of glory, and now at the very end of this chapter, in in, in verses 31 through 39, uh, he is going to ask five questions, five rhetorical questions, and give us a statement. That, that are going to show us that we absolutely, that we have in our spiritual life, on our spiritual team, we have a star player and we have an advocate. We have the two things necessary 
for this lopsided victory. He's going to give us five questions. Now, 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 these are not technical questions because a lot of times in the Bible, what we try to do is we'll try to analyze every word and, and, and we'll try to say, well, what's the, sometimes um, when you use persuasion, you, you try to use things that are like. like and, and so Paul is going to say in verse 31, what, can, what shall we say to these things? Now, what things is he talking about? He's talking about this argument that he's laid out, saying that you and I can't earn it, we can't deserve it. And what is it? God's favor. We can't earn, we can't work our way into God's favor. We cannot earn our way onto Team Jesus. You can't earn the Team Jesus jersey. It is only given to you as a gift. That's it. So what do we say about these things? Because, man, if I can't earn it, right, can can it be taken away as easy, as easily as I've got? I mean, if it, it didn't require me to work for it, so can it be taken away for no reason? And Paul is gonna address this, and he's gonna ask this first question. If God is for us, Who can be against us? Who can be against us? That's the first question. Who can be against you? Who can be against you if God is on your side? Who can can beat you if the creator of all of this if the creator of, 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 you know, of, of the streams and the trees and the, the mountains and the, the goats and the fish, if who, who can possibly do anything against you if the creator of the universe is on your side? You have a ringer. <laughs> I mean, you have the best player in the league. <clears throat> it bring, it'd be like bringing Emmett Smith and playing with a bunch of 10-year-olds. You have a ringer on your side. God is for you. He, you are on his team. He is, he is the best player and the best coach. <laughs> Who possibly could defeat you? Who can be against you? The next question is, will he not give you what you need? Will he not give you? So, so not, only, not only do you have God on your side, but you, he's asking the rhetorical question, who, like, will, will God not give you what you need for, for a lopsided victory? And he says this in verse 32 this way. Did he who not spare, who, did who, oh, sorry. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he also with him graciously give us all things. How will he not do that? If God was to go in and go so far to sacrifice his son, do you think he won't go? If you think God will get you, you know, to the five-yard line, do you think he'll not do the work to also push you over? Do you think that God will will give up his only son and, and send him to die on your behalf and mine only to let you rot and wither, only to let you fail because you didn't do do something little? Do you think God will not give you what you need if he's already given up his son? Will he not finish the job? Will he not take you to the end, right? And so if you ask this question, well, well, I was given the Team Jesus jersey by doing nothing, is it, is it, can I lose it? Is God just going to take it back as, you know, for no reason? Because there's no reason I got it except for faith. I didn't earn it or deserve it. And Paul says, no. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't send his son to die to give it to you just so he could take it back because you said a bad word or you didn't pray or you messed up really bad. Question number three. Who will accuse you to God that you are guilty? Who is able to do that? 
Verse 33, he says, Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. He says, God's already, God's already declared you just. God's already declared, through Jesus, if, when you follow Jesus, God has declared you forgiven, justified, everything's been made right. And no one comes along. I mean, we, we, we have this, we have this, in our justice system, uh, justice system called double jeopardy, you can't you can't be tried again for the same trial for the same crime. And, and what Paul is saying is, you Jesus isn't going to give you the team Jesus dirt jersey, right? When God declares you just and right, and He gives you the team Jesus jersey, He's not going to go, "Oh, I forgot that you did that. Give it back." You've already, and no one. If He's not going to do that then who can declare you guilty? Then he says this, so, that he, so question five is, who will render a guilty verdict on you? So not only, who will, not only who will accuse you of guilt, but who can judge you guilty? Verse 34, Paul says, who is to condemn Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, it was he who was raised. Who was at the right hand of God? Who indeed inter- is interceding for us? Paul is saying, not only is no one going to accuse you of guilt, not only is anybody going to have a, an actual claim that you're guilty, but no one can judge you that. No one can render you guilty because it's God himself who sent his son to die for you, who, who, who bought your justification, and it's the Spirit who pleads your case on his behalf, on your behalf, to God. You're in the clear. God's not taking it back. There's nothing that you can do to unearn this love of God. And he says as much in this fifth question. Right? So it's who can be against us? Will God not give us what we need? Who will accuse you of guilt? Who will render you guilty? And he ends this this fifth question with this. Who will separate us from God's love? Verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Now this is, Paul's giving a list, but this is not exhaustive. What in the world, he's saying, what in the world can separate us from this love that Christ has given to us, this love that we have for Jesus? What, what in the world can, what created thing, what thing in this world can separate us from the love of God? What can, what can strip you of your Team Jesus jersey? And Paul gives us a list, and it, again, it's not a, this is a, a persuasion technique. It is not an exhaustive list, or else he would have just kept going. Because really, there's not very much difference between, I mean, in fact, like semantically, dictionary-wise, tribulation and distress are basically the same thing. In, in the original language. And persecution and famine are, are things that happen kind of outside of you. You know, whether it's a person does it or else it's, it's nature. And he's like, hey, nakedness, danger, or sore. I mean, there's, there's all of these, these things that can happen that, that pose a threat to you, but which one of you? Now, he's not saying that these are good or they're comfortable or they're, you know, or they're fun. He's saying which of these things will separate you from God's love. Which one of these things will make you forfeit the Team Jesus jersey? And the answer is no one or nothing. Right? Nothing and no one can separate you from the love of God. Nothing and no one can accuse you of, of, of guilt. Nothing and no one can declare you guilty. Nothing and no one can be against us. Nothing and no one can keep us from, from, from God giving us what we need. Because in him, in God, and in Christ, we have an advocate. We have the best player on the field, and we have an advocate. 
right? He, he is a protector. He is one that has our back. He is one who loves us and who cares for us. He will be there for us. He, he fights for us. You know, he, not only does he, you know, he, not only does he coach us, he runs the ball for us, right? He, he, the, the spirit goes and helps us play the game. And sometimes it's hard for us to see it. And sometimes it's hard for us even to visualize it. And, and I'm gonna, I, I think I've showed you this before if you've, if you've been around Grace very long. Uh, but a long time ago, my daughter drew something that was a great visual representation of this. She actually drew it twice. It was such a powerful picture for, for both of us. I mean, a, a long time ago when Bethany was, uh, my daughter Bethany was, was dealing with some stuff, when she was a little kid, she and I, we had some great talks, and we spent a lot of time dealing with this issue. And she's always been quite the artist and quite the singer, and, you know, she's a creative. She is very much unlike me. And when she was little, in elementary school, she drew this picture. She drew this picture, and, and this picture, you know, is a, it's a bunny rabbit and a bear. And it's, it's the bear laying down, and it's the bunny rabbit on top. And she draws this picture and says, this is me and you, Dad. She can rest. She could rest because she knew that she had my support. She could calm down. She felt safe. She felt loved. She felt cared for, protected. And I'm not comparing me to God. I mean, I just, that's just a dad trying to help his daughter. But this is, the, this is the, the picture of God. But then years later, when she was in high school, she draws this other picture. This one right here. And in this picture, you can see the bear and the, the, bear and the bunny are in two different spots. So, you know, it's no longer one, you know, laying on the other. It's, but it's very much the bear looking out. And it's the rabbit doing her thing. And in her mind, that was us too. She had moved past this place where she was venturing out. But she knew I was there. You see, it's so important to have an advocate. I mean, it's so important to have an advocate that, that psychologists will tell you, Man, if you, if you felt lonely and afraid and alone when you were growing up, if you felt like your parents did not support you, uh, that, like it physically raises your cortisol levels, your, your, your stress hormone levels, when you're adult, years after. And there are books, there are books written about how to deal with parents. So when you become an adult, there, there's great books written about how to deal with having parents that don't support you and, and aren't advocates for you. I mean, I've, I've had several friends. Uh, th there's a book called, you know, Adult Parents Dealing with Emotionally Immature, Adult Children Dealing with Emotionally Adult, Adult, Emotion, okay, would you mark that? In fact, there's a book that I've had several friends read, and, and I've, I've recommended. Uh, the title is, is Adult Children with Emotionally Immature Parents. I mean, it's, it's, it's this incredible book saying, hey, when you become an adult, you know, you don't, the support you need is emotional. You need, you need support from your mom and dad if, if they're around. You need, you know, and if it's not your mom and dad, but, but especially if it's your mom and dad, you need emotional support. You need an advocate. You need someone. Uh, and, but and if you don't have that, when, if you have to be a support for them, it messes you all up. And, I mean, it causes some really desperate emotional and mental health problems. Like that's how important it is. That is how important it is to have this advocate. And let me just tell you, God is that advocate. In John 16, Jesus is talking to his disciples before he's gonna be, before he is, he is executed. And he's, he's speaking very frankly to them. He's saying, listen, like, I'm going to leave, 
and I'm going to be gone from you, and you're going to wonder where I'm going, and then, but I'm going to, but I'm going to tell you things. And, but, but you're also going to be able to do some things. You're going to be able to ask God for anything through me, and, and you're going to get, I mean, he's, it's some pretty heavy, heavy-duty things. And his disciples, who, you know, Jesus has quit speaking in parables, and they said, man, man, Jesus, we know, you aren't speaking in parables. We know that you, you are, can do anything. You don't, need, you don't need to ask anybody for anything because you can do all things. And we believe that you came from God. I mean, and Jesus is like, so, I mean, like, now you believe? I mean, how many miracles have you seen? And how many, how, how much have you seen of my life day in and day out? So now you finally believe? And he says this in chapter 16, verse 32. He says, Behold, the hour is coming, indeed it has come, when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and you will leave me alone. He's talking about his crucifixion. Now, this is in, they're having a hard time fathoming this. They, they, they just said, you, you, are the, like, you are the Messiah, without a doubt, absolutely. They've, they've said it before, and he's like, okay, you know, are, you've said it a bunch. Like, is this, do you mean it? And he said, everyone is going to leave me. I'm just telling you now. Everyone is going to leave me, and I'll be alone. But he says this, yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. And he says this, then. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus is saying, I, I am your advocate. Right? In this world you'll have trouble, just like Jesus had trouble. I'm going to have trouble. I, if you've lived long enough, I mean, what, the first time, like when you come into the world, it's trouble, right? I mean, right? You, you leave the warmth of the womb and you come out and it's cold and it's bright and, you know, they're, 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 they're wiping all the ick off of you and, and you're crying. And I mean, that, that, that's a bad way to start. And I don't know if it gets any better. <laughs> And he says, you will have trouble. Like, that's an understatement. Jesus had trouble. He said, but I say these things to you, that you're going to leave me alone, but I will not be alone because I have the Father. I say these things to you that you may have peace because you will experience trouble. And they didn't know the half of it. In this world, you will experience tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Jesus, Jesus is saying the same thing Paul is saying. In God, you have an advocate. In God, you have an advocate. In God, you have someone on your team who is the best player. In God, you can have victory in life because you have the best player on the you have the best player in the league and you have the the greatest coach the greatest advocate you could ever ask for and those two things together are all you have to have to dominate whatever whatever thing you're doing and what Paul is saying is that you absolutely can have a lopsided victory in life and it may not look what you think it looks like it may not be cars and, and, and money and swimming pools, like it may not be that, but you can absolutely have victory in life because you have the best, the best player in the league and the best coach, that advocate. Always, they're always at your disposal. When everyone leaves you, you still have the best player in the league, you still have the best advocate. When everyone leaves you alone like they deserted Jesus, when you feel like there's no one to turn to and no one on your side and the odds are stacked against you, you have the best player in the league and you have the absolute best advocate. And not only do you have them, but you need to know you have them. And even Paul, so he, Paul in verse 36 quotes Psalm 44. 
And it says we are being led to the sheep. We, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Paul's saying, listen, we, ha- we are experiencing trouble. We are experiencing what Jesus promised. In this world, you will have tribulation. You will have trouble. He says, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. No, in all these things, he finishes up, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers or height or depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So it doesn't matter. What what can separate us? Height, depth, nope. Life, death, nope. What about angels or demons, nope. What about any, any, any person, any ruler, right? The, the king of the world, nope. What about demonic activity? What about, nope. It doesn't matter. For we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Jesus says, I have overcome the world. And Paul reiterates and says, hey, listen, in this world we will have trouble. Jesus said it, and it's gonna happen. It's already happening. In this world we will have trouble, and we are having trouble. But he says these things to us so that we may have peace because he's overcome the world. And Paul is saying that we are now, we're not conquerors. We're a, level bo- we're a level above. I don't, even know what, I don't even know what more than a conqueror is. But that's what we are. Right? Like, like we're not the champions. We're more than champions. What, what does that mean? I don't know, but it's pretty good. <laughs> like if being the champ, like we won the championship this week, and that was great, but what does it mean to, to be more than champs? I don't know, but sign me up for that. Sign me up for that to be more than champions. If, if you were to tell me, hey, hey, you're gonna conquer the league next year, great, sign me up, I'll, I'll take that. And if somebody says, but wait, what if you can more than conquer it? Again, I don't know how what that means, sign me up. Because we are more than conquerors. In Jesus Christ, you have peace. Right, but peace doesn't mean that you just sit and are quiet. Right, peace doesn't mean that you have no problems. Right, peace means that you are more than conquerors. That, that you're, you more than dominate, you're, you're, you're more than champs. You are more than conquerors because you have the best player in the league and you have the best advocate, the best coach the person that is always with you, the person that was with Jesus when everyone deserted him, the person that was with Paul, you know, God who was with Paul when everyone had abandoned him, that same God will be with you. That should give you confidence and that should give you peace no matter what happens, no matter what what you're going through, no matter how alone you feel, no matter how isolated you are, you have God on your side and God in it with you playing the game and you will come out victorious. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are with us but you're not just with us, you're you're in it with us. And and you're not just in it with us, you are advocating for us. You are are playing with us as well. So Father, help us to be conquerors, help us to be champions, but help us through you be more than champions, be more than conquerors in life. Help us know that we have someone to turn to and your son, Jesus. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Love you guys. We'll see you next week.